Hello and welcome to Showcase, TRT World's flagship arts and culture program coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. We're taking you around the world on this episode, sharing exciting stories like China's latest mega movie. We'll take you to a church turned space museum in Ukraine and show you some beautiful recycled sculptures from Finland. But first. Two guys, one piano, a very millennial and musical way of transforming a 19th century relic. Now it's not quite a film festival, more of an art fair that plays videos. People trusted her, they shared their secrets with her, and in a certain sense, they chose her as much as she chose them. If only these walls could speak, getting up close and intimate with the work of photographer Diane Arbus. Diane Arbus was one of the most striking and influential artists of the 20th century, known for her powerful, confronting photographs of faces from all walks of society. Now an exhibition that was first shown at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art has come to London's Hayward Gallery. On display are almost 100 photographs from the very first seven years of her career. We sent Miranda Addy to find out exactly what it is about this photographer that resonates from New York to London. She's one of the uh, most well-known American photographers. She emerged in the 1950s, and this exhibition looks at her earliest work, the beginnings, the genesis of her, um, her career. And she was essentially a portraitist, and she looked very broadly at the world. She made pictures of people who were right in the middle of the society and people who lived in a more eccentric lifestyle. This is Diane Arbus in the beginning. From 1956 to 62, she photographed children and performers, couples and people living on the margins of New York City. Her work is arresting and difficult. And unlike other photographers of the era, the people in her photographs look directly at you. People trusted her. They shared their secrets with her. And in a certain sense, they chose her as much as she chose them. And she created a body of work that is very distinct from that of her peer. Her peers were trying to hide the camera, trying to sneak a picture, trying to be a voyeur but not be seen. And she wanted a direct connection with the people. And she allowed them to use her to present who they thought they were to the world. And that's what the exhibition focuses on. Identical twins really encapsulates Arbus's preoccupation with identity. The twins are dressed the same, they have the same haircut. At first glance, there's a real uniformity in everything about them. And yet, look at their faces. This is how they express their individuality. The photograph is also seen as the inspiration behind the twins in Stanley Kubrick's horror flick, The Shining. Arbus started taking photographs in the 1940s after her husband Alan, a respected photographer himself, gifted her a camera. But it wasn't until 1956 that she began pursuing it as a career. And this exhibition includes some of her most outstanding work, including Jack Dracula at a bar. It's a simple shot, and at the same time, it's exceptional. The idea of working on the street and interacting with people, that direct one-on-one -on -one approach, was hugely influ influential from the day, it, but it's influenced photographers worldwide. It's influenced subjects to believe in themselves. So even people who are not image makers, but we're all image making when we perform our own lives, hugely influential on the film world. A lot of filmmakers look to her as, um, as a model of creativity and inspiration. Arbus took her own life in 1971, following severe bouts of depression. But during her career, she was never afraid to offer a new perspective. She continually challenged perceptions about the traditional relationship 
between the observer and the observed, and what it means to see, and crucially, be seen. Diane Arbus, in the beginning, runs until May the 6th. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Now it seems like the contemporary art world can't get enough of all these biennales, viennales, and other mouthful names for fancy art events. And apparently since 1984, we've had a video nale. Now you'd be forgiven for never having heard of it because video art hasn't really hit the mainstream. But having said that, every single Turner Prize winner last year was a video artist. Maybe they're onto something. The theme for this year's Video Nale is Refracted Realities, which refers to the movement of light waves. The festival is taking place in the German city of Bonn and it showcases 29 pieces selected from over 1,000 submissions from around the world. Very competitive. Well, to take us through what Video Nale is all about is Tasia Langenbach, who's the artistic director. Thanks for joining us on Showcase. Thank you very much for having me. Tassa, the description says it's a festival for time-based arts. What do you mean by that? Um, yeah, time-based arts is basically the expression for all art um, forms like performance, sound art, video, film. So basically um, all arts which are kind of related to time or need time to, um, to evolve. Um, so you need, they need time to develop, you need time to spend time with them. Um, so it's basically, yeah. The, the contrary to um, to painting, photography, where you have the artwork always there. Um, with time-based arts, it's more the involvement of time which is needed to perceive the work. And how exactly do you display 29 pieces of video art in a museum? Yeah, that's kind of a challenge actually, because um, you have to find a way to arrange the works in the exhibition in a way so that um, I mean, you have sound and you have images, of course, um, when you present video art. Um, and that's kind of a concurrence um, situation for the artworks as well. And usually the way museums present video art is to put them into black boxes, like these typical black boxes where you open a curtain, go in and go out again. Uh, when you present 29 works, that's kind of difficult because it doesn't make the, the exhibition um, like easy to, to perceive for the spectator. So we work together with, um, with exhibition architects who find a way to present the works so that you can kind of perceive them um, with a focus on the single work but still have a relation between the artworks. So it's a very open kind of um, exhibition presentation. And how did you go about curating this year's festival? What was your focus? So we have a topic which we give to every regionale, to the um, to the competition, to the call for entries. We um, we communicate worldwide um, for artists to send in their works, um, and that's of course like a very important um, focus for us to to find the relevant topic to be to be discussed. Now the theme this year is refractured realities. Can you try and explain that for us? Yes, yeah, topic which evolved very much um, out of a feeling um, I had that um, that we're more and more living in times where we perceive reality as refracted um, by the way it is presented in the media. So there's more and more diverse media which can be consumed by by the people. You have social media, you have blogs, you have the internet, of course, you have newspapers still, you have TV and broadcast stations. Um, and my feeling is that. Um, it's more and more difficult to, to refer to one reality, but there are more and more filter um, bubbles popping up where everybody can present its, his or her own um, reality. And it's more and more difficult to get into communication about those different realities. So the idea was really to, to think about the way we, um, we present and represent reality in media and how maybe also artists and the way they work with media um, can help to, to find like a new perspective on, on the realities we're living in. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Tassa Langenbach, for joining us on Showcase. Thank you very much for having me. Now, do you remember when GarageBand first came out? We all took a stab at making our own songs on our computers, didn't we? It was so empowering to be able to compose music using just our keyboards. 
Well, in Ukraine, a group of musicians have taken things further by creating their own studio full of instruments, not on a laptop, but on a piano. And it's 200 years old. Take a look. Houston, we have a problem. That's it, I'm going under. Time's up for our left son. We were just a one hit wonder. Sorry, I had to text it. I'm done. This is my Brexit. Try to press rewind. I swear, all of my attempts were desperate. Oh, this is so crazy. Go try to amaze me. You fire back, start yelling in caps. Perhaps you, you. Still to come on Showcase, China's new space mission. The nation's first homegrown sci-fi blockbuster takes off. Destination, foreign cinemas. The final frontier, we head over to Ukraine to visit one of the most unorthodox museums in the world. stories with old clothes. We'll show you the work of one Finnish artist who's making us question just about everything. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the worlds of culture and the arts. Friends, family and fashionistas from across the globe continue to pay tribute to fashion virtuoso and Chanel's creative director Karl Lagerfeld. In Paris, people have laid flowers at the entrance of the Chanel store and in London, a minute silence was held at Fashion Week, all to honor a man who ruled the global fashion industry for the last half century. He did so many things and I think this is the reason that people loved Karl. I think he has influenced and will continue to influence generations in the fashion world. You know, he famously said that he wanted to die on the stage, which, which he did, and you know, I, I think that probably says quite a lot about his sparkling wit. If you don't have the music of today, the mood of today, and the feeling of today, if fashion doesn't say anything, it wouldn't be fashion. Then it would be pretentious creation who have no real life. British rock band Queen will perform live at the Oscars ceremony following the success of one of this year's Best Picture nominees, Bohemian Rhapsody. Taking on Freddie's iconic vocals is former American Idol star Adam Lambert. He'll join Brian May and Roger Taylor, the two remaining members of the band. It's no secret that every major movie company wants to capitalize on the Chinese film market, the second largest after the U.S. But does it work the other way around? Are moviegoers around the world embracing made-in-China movies? While many Chinese production companies want that to be the case, they're pushing hard for homegrown blockbusters to crack foreign markets. In 2016, they even got Matt Damon and Pedro Pascal to star in The Great Wall. Well, this year, another Chinese mega movie is out, and this time it's a big budget space epic. The late 20th century saw the national cinema of China make a splash on the global film arena in the form of small scale art house features. 
that received wide acceptance at high-profile movie festivals. Then with the arrival of the new millennium, mainland's polished, high-quality martial art productions won the hearts of action cinema lovers abroad. And now, Chinese studios are looking to push out big-budget, CGI-heavy flicks to moviegoers across the globe. And that golden ticket could be The Wandering Earth, a homegrown big-budget sci-fi motion picture for international audiences that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hollywood. The plot borrows heavily from other Hollywood doomsday scenarios. The sun begins losing its power, and a united Earth government decides to move our planet to a new star system through a dangerous journey. And it's no coincidence that this sci-fi voyage flick feels like your typical Tinseltown movie fair, since, apparently, the film's makers carefully study the success of past master directors like Stanley Kubrick and George Lucas. Wandering Earth is a great film in terms of launching it at, at such a timing that it coincides China's growth. And uh, in terms of filmmaking, in terms of film as a film, it still has a long way to go. You know, Hollywood has a long tradition of science fiction. We have all these masterpieces that Chinese filmmakers can, can learn, such as uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars. All these master films are really the role model for China to, to, to really study. In the real world, China has become one of the high-stake players in global space exploration, and the wandering Earth is reflecting that drive. Officials from the Chinese Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation believe the production not only represents China's new film aesthetics, but also the country's scientific ambitions. We just uh, live in this uh, era, and uh, this makes more innovations and more creativity, uh, creativity to us. Uh, so that's the uh, things happened, not only in the, uh, in the movie making, but also in the space field. But China still faces an uphill battle in winning the hearts and minds of global audiences. Even films like The Wandering Earth, which has made half a billion dollars in just two weeks, are finding it hard to get screen time in international markets, where long-established Hollywood brands reign supreme. Chinese production companies are finding out that they need to win over global theater chains before they even get a shot at film critics and movie fans. One small step for man, one giant leap for faith in Ukraine. When the country was part of the Soviet Union, many religious buildings were destroyed or repurposed during the USSR's infamous anti-religion campaign. One church was even turned into a space museum. But things certainly have changed in the country. And the fate of this particular church-turned-museum is now up in the air. This 19th century church in central Ukraine has a pleasant secret inside. It still promises to show you the heavens, but of a different kind. Inside you won't find altars or stained glass. Instead, you'll be blessed with rockets and satellites. The church was transformed into a museum in the 1970s to celebrate the achievements of the space race between the then USSR and the United States. The star of the attraction and a legend in Soviet history is cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, who beat out his US rivals to become the first man in space. Not to be outdone, the US capped its victory by beating the Soviets to the moon in 1969. It was also no accident that the Soviets chose churches as sites to push their anti-religious agenda. By tapping into the popularity of the space race, many people say they were drawn in without even realizing the stark symbolism. By using images of space explorations and scientific achievements to sway people's beliefs. The space industry was crazy popular at the time, in the 1970s when every boy dreamed of becoming a cosmonaut. It was a time of intense centralized propaganda, and that's why people didn't ask questions, such as how could a church become a space museum? 
But almost 50 years on, the museum's location is now becoming a controversial topic. Many are calling for the church to be reverted back into a place of worship. Of course there are different opinions and thoughts. We have scientists and intellectuals coming to us asking, quite upset, why is a museum like this in a religious building? It's a recurring question, but give us a place for our exhibition and we'll vacate the religious buildings so they can serve their original purpose. But not everyone is sold that Soviet intentions were sinister. Volkodov believes that the Soviet skull was not necessarily to mock religion, but to choose a building that had a large open space. It's a reason he believes that has kept the structure standing until this day. The Space Museum may be here today. Maybe in the future it will move elsewhere. But this structure will stand. It has been here for more than 100 years and it will stand for a long time. And I hope everyone will be able to see it. With the structure of the church showing its wear and tear, much like the exhibits on display, its future as a museum is still an open question. Many are hoping that both pieces of history can be kept intact without harming the other. Well, that's it for this edition of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more of our global arts coverage. But before we go, ever wonder where your old clothes end up? Well, one leading contemporary artist in Finland has been recycling consumer products to create striking sculptures. Take a look at the work of Karina Kaikonen. I'm Sandra Gatman. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.